Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here, to be asked back. Thank you, Suzanne, and to the Avenues to Wellness program for asking me to come back again. <sighs> what a nice crowd. Um, so I want to start tonight with a practice called somatic centering. I've written the word soma on the board over here. Um, soma is, comes from a Greek word that means the whole person, um, which includes the body and mind and the energy that makes life happen. As beings that have bodies, it's a very useful. My kids are often asking me, why do you practice meditation? It's just great. It's always great to be asked questions by children, right? Because then you really have to think about uh, a simple and honest answer. And the answer that I come up with is to be present. So uh, I'd like to start tonight with um, a somatic practice of finding our center in our bodies. So with your permission, I would like to lead you. Um, so if you could find your feet on the floor, you might set aside things that are in your hands and uh, maybe place your hands somewhere or comfortably on your lap and find the chair that supports your body here. Find your sit bones and find your spine leaving your sit bones. Just in other words, pay attention to your posture for a moment. Feel the flats of your feet on the ground. Find how your spine leaves your sit bones. How does it lift up into your rib cage? And just maybe close your eyes if you need to or gaze down at the floor and figure out for yourself what's happening in your body. Are you leaning left and right? You might kind of just rock onto your right sit bone, rock onto your left sit bone a little bit and and then settle slowly in towards the center. You might lean forward a little bit, back a little bit and rock a little bit and try to find the center. In chairs, it takes a little bit of muscle work to hold yourself up. And what happens above your low back as you come up into your chest, your spine? Does it cave, does it twist? Maybe you can invite the shoulders back a little bit. I'm just going to keep my uh, focus gaze down and again invite you to keep your focus down or close your eyes if you need to. So inviting the shoulders to open up allows more room for breathing. And uh, keeping the arms a little bit away from the torso not only allows more room for breathing but it also invites others to be close to you. We find when we're nervous or tense, we tighten in our flanks and protect our flanks. So at this time, I invite you to kind of open up your flanks a little bit. Relax a little bit. And then what happens above the shoulders? Is the neck long? Sometimes we talk about a golden thread lifting from the occipital, just a thread. It's not a chain. It's not like a meat hook. It's just a thread. So you know, you're not trying to rip yourself up, but just lightly lifting up towards the heavens, towards the cosmos. And at the same time, the same energy settling down through the sit bones, down into the earth. Breathe in and settle down into the earth. Feel the feet on the floor, legs on the chair. Feel the low back and the, feel the chest and the arms. There's 28 muscles in your face that you can relax. Good luck with that might just start with a little smile, but maybe bring some attention to the forehead, and the eyes, cheeks, the jaw. You can touch your own face with your hands and just 
Relax a little. Teeth do not need to press tightly against each other. With each exhale, feel your weight settle down into your chair. With each inhale, feel some rise up the spine, all the way up that golden thread into the heavens. Exhale back down into the earth. So this is just finding your posture and your breath. Once you've found your breath, just try to follow it. Thoughts probably come up before you can breathe one or two breaths, but just come back to your posture. Feel the sit bones and the weight settling down, relaxing shoulder blades. Feel the energy rising up through you to the heavens, spreading outward. Always coming back to the exhale. So the body is always present. It's the main reason to notice the body. It brings us into the present. And by thinking of the posture, we connect mind and body together. So this topic of soma, I'm going to lead you through a little bit. You can just keep your gaze downward. Keep focusing on your posture and your breath. The first element that we'll center in is our length. Our length is that space that you alone occupy between earth and heavens it is the gift that you are that all creation has allowed you to be here is totally a miracle you are unique never again will somebody like you walk this planet so feel the space that you occupy between the earth and the cosmos. The length of your being. You have a connection to the earth and you are lifted up by the spirit or energy. Feel your length with some dignity, whatever dignity you have. All the forces in life have a tendency to want to make us smaller, force us into one box or another or 10,000 different boxes, suppressing us presses us down and down. So in this moment, try to find your own dignity. The grace of being upright. Continue to follow your own breath and feel your own posture. And let's talk about the second element of somatic center is width. So you have a width, you have a, a dimension of left and right. This is where I suggested you raise your arms a little bit away from your rib cage and allow your flanks to be open. 
Allow the light to come into your eyes and the sound to come into your ears. This is also a part of our wit, how we contact the world, how the world contacts us. How we connect. Information comes in. How we experience consciousness. So what do you see? Notice what you see. What do you hear? Notice what you hear. What sensation? Notice how the world contacts you. Notice the space in the room. Notice that there are others here with you. You are not alone. Human beings are entirely social animals. So notice your place amongst humanity. Right here in your own body. Do you shrink right or left? Again, staying with your own breath and your own posture. Let's move to the third element of somatic centering is depth. Depth is front to back. So feel your back. Feel the muscles working. Feel your front. Notable feature about our back is that we can't see it. Much like everything in our past that has brought us here today is gone. So maybe take a moment to remember all that has brought you here today. All the choices, all the mistakes, failures, triumphs, lessons, losses, blessings. Maybe take a moment to remember your parents, children or spouse, close family members that have given you the love and support you needed to be here today. Or maybe given you some idea of what you didn't want or didn't need, and so you went a different direction. Maybe take a moment to remember your teachers, those that taught you the lessons, gave you the opportunities to learn. All that brought you here today is all right there, right behind you. Tremendous wave of blessing. Feel the gratitude. And in front of you, <clears throat> the future lies. It's also invisible. We don't know what it will bring, but we have some choice in it. We have some agency to reach out with our actions, to reach out with our words, to reach out with our prayers and thoughts. Somewhere in the middle of all that is past and all that is future is right now. So find that in your body. It's very physically located right in the middle of front and back. Breathe into that place. And notice what's there, what's alive. What is now? What do we want for our future? What are our thoughts or prayers for the future? 
What will our words be? What will our actions be? What are we committed to? What is our vow? I would say that our vow is our center. So find your vow somewhere through all that. Just quietly for a minute. Coming back into the room, you can raise your sight. Move a little. Thank you all for taking that time to arrive. I'm pretty sure we're all here. That might have been the longest somatic centering I've ever done. It can happen in a matter of a couple seconds also. So I encourage you to take these three things and use them anytime you find yourself you can find yourself a little more with these tools um, length width and depth how was that a little feedback maybe three people just give a word or two how, how was that for you what, what came up <laughs> yeah. yeah, what happens when you settle down? Relax. Relax, yeah. Can't move. Peaceful. Yeah. What comes up in that relaxed, peaceful state? It brought me here. I've been running all day, so it was good. Yeah. It brought me here. Right here. Yeah. Awareness. Yeah, good. Uh, what comes up in awareness? What are you aware of? Um, I was aware of myself in the midst of things that were going on around me, and so it was easy to, in that place, I could come back and stay with where I was, uh -huh. where I am. Uh -huh. And that what it was still on the other floor, and then it was like I could go, and then, but I was, I could come back. Yeah. Because I was aware of this place Good. that I could Yeah. Here we have a name for that called uh, finding your seat. You know, like, like having a, a place, oh, this is where I am. You know, I don't have to be attached to everything that's going on around me. Yeah. Other things, what were, a couple more. What came up for people? Gratitude. All the things of the past that brought you to where you are today. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Good. The flip side of gratitude, I find, is um, is purpose. Purpose. Um, so that's why I like to bring it that way. You know, if we if we can feel if we can feel some gratitude for everything that has got us here. Then from here, what will we bring forward? You know, what will we bring forward? You know. Um, did anybody come up with any word or nugget when uh, in the idea of uh, finding what is your vow? What is um, what feels most important to you? At this moment. Yeah, at this moment in time. Just being present, is that what you're saying? No, no, I, oh. I, I, it's going to change. Yes. <laughs> so at this point, it was living healthy. Health. Yeah. yeah. Living healthy. Yeah. Well, I strive to live in the moment. Just the present moment. Live in the moment. Be present. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. The goal was to keep going every day. Keep going. Just keep going. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, ha uh, have some energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. And improve. Good, good. Wonderful. Well, um, so so the the introduction to this talk, which which um, Suzanne and I were talking about, um, kind of we've we've already done that. You know, from a settled state of mind, we feel a sense of what matters most to us. 
that which our whole body leans towards, that which we are committed to. So last year when I was here, I talked uh, about the idea of practice. I don't know how many of you were here or got to see that video or whatever, but I talked about the idea of practice and the, and the fundament of practice is having a vow. It's having something that you're going towards and you're always coming back to. As human beings, we always uh, fall off of that. The nature of mind is to get distracted. And so the value of vow is to uh, is have a, um, a target or, a, you know, some people say like a North Star, you know, something that you can always steer back to, steer back to. And so that talk was, a, was about the practice of, uh, of being willing to make mistakes and allowing our vow to, to be that which guides us back. And so I want to bring that up again in, in relationship to difficult conversations, our topic tonight, because to me, that, that's, that's the only thing that I can offer you, really, you know, is, is um, to know what's most important to you and at all risks, return back to that. Um, when things get difficult, we, we have a tendency to throw ourselves under the bus, throw what's most important to us under the bus, you know. Not to mention throwing the person that we're talking to under the bus. Just like. So this idea of, uh, this practice of, of centering, of, of, of being present, remembering what's most important to us, I think is the most fundamental tool for difficult conversations. So let me just um, explore this a little bit more. In order to fulfill or express this commitment, we often find we need to coordinate with others. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> so coordination. Um, I mentioned in my bio Aikido, and I feel like um, for me, Aikido is the study of coordination. Uh, for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with it at all, the Japanese martial art of Aikido is uh, the harmonizing uh, energy study, is what that uh, means phonetically. In other words, it's really the, the study or practice of, um, of learning how to make harmony with... Uh, different kinds of energies, potentially conflicting energies. In other words, I would say that most simply say coordinating with others. It seems to me in my own life that the people that I uh, care about most are the hardest to coordinate with. <laughs> you know? Um, and... One of the most important topics that I, that I hope that we, we get to touch on tonight <clears throat> are those topics around really uh, end of life, living and dying. And um, sometimes just the, the, liter the, the basic act of coordinating with others uh, inhibits us from really being able to say the things that we, we need to say and, and hear, um, be the listener that somebody else needs to have. And so, um, so again, I offer you this tool of somatic centering as, as the best thing that I can offer you for uh, being able to coordinate with another. It's actually knowing where your center is and, and being able to come back to your center and remain on your center when others are <clears throat> either offering us feedback, uh, requested or not requested, grounded or not grounded. Uh, are offering us um, requests, um, you know, whether or not we invited them. This is, this is a pool of energy, a give and take, a pool of energy. This is the coordination. That's what I mean by coordination, is this pool of energy back and forth. And so um, this practice that we just went through of, of, of finding our own center, I really like the way you said that, how, how you found awareness of yourself and then what was going on around you didn't matter so much you know it was like didn't have to get so involved with it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. quieted the irritation yeah 
In these meaningful relationships, inevitably we find ourselves off balance, either pushed by others or pushing ourselves beyond our sustainable capacity. And that, that's a point that I, um, I find in my own life is that uh, I am my own worst enemy. I don't know if other people feel that also, but <clears throat> I push myself so hard that I, uh, I kind of make it impossible for others to uh, reach me, you know? Sometimes I want so badly for things to, to, to go a certain way or, um, or I'm just trying so hard that what I really need to do is stop, you know? Uh, so that's really a good self-awareness. That's the thing about being upright, is feeling like, am I leaning into this relationship too much, you know? Really, our bodies will tell the story. <clears throat> if, um, when we do somatic coaching, one of the biggest things we do is stand, called standing practice, where we stand and engage in a conversation. And as the coach, uh, I just simply observe the body and it tells the story. Like if somebody gets into a conversation, they're telling me about this, 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 and they're going like this and they're getting more. And then the chin goes up and they're going like, and, you know, and I can tell exactly the energy that's in the body because it's totally visible. Um, <clears throat> and the chin goes up, you've cut off the rest of your whole body. Right back here, you're totally become cerebral. So then hence the lengthening of the back of the neck helps reconnect to the whole body. Leaning forward, you've put your, everything you care about in front of your center. You put your caring center in front of your, your weight center, in front of your stability center. And so to bring your, your heart center back on top of your weight center, you um, have more sustainability. You know, you're coming from your power source in your lower body. So anyways, these are just things to be aware of. Um, about watching ourselves. I really like some of the things that you all experienced about just becoming aware of yourself. Because as, as Susan and I, Suzanne and I were talking before, um, I feel like the most important thing in having difficult conversations is being able to be a listener. It's, um, I, was, I was explaining to her that, that I came up with this topic thinking of our national political divide <clears throat> that we find ourselves in these days in 2019, where um, we've kind of, as a, as, a, as a national organism, we've kind of developed a lot of self-hate and a lot of um, divide. And so I wondered, uh, how can we bring up the practice in our own lives of how to be better listeners? Because... Um, so often, it's not what we're arguing about that's really the problem. It's just that we're not connecting with each other. We're not hearing each other. So this thing about being off balance is really important. You know, finding our own centers and, and, and returning back to it. Um, like I said at the very beginning, the nature of mind is to stick. So... Uh, We'll also find ourselves leaning off to the side like this sometimes when we're talking to someone or leaning off to the, you know, one side or the other. And that's literally what's happening in that moment is the mind has gotten sidetracked on a, on a, on a thought and is literally stuck. <laughs> While the energy is trying to go forward, the mind is stuck over here. It just shows up in the body. It is in these stressful times that we build or destroy trust. Therefore, navigating difficult conversations is critical to moving toward the future we imagine possible. I wanted to just be, you know, speak from my own experience about difficult conversations, and what I have found is that um, whatever I think the topic is, is really not what's important in the conversation. Really what's important in the conversation is, uh, is creating trust, reconnecting and creating trust. As soon as that has happened, the information that needs to happen is like effortless. But where the effort is needed is in recreating the trust. 
Um, and what I find destroys trust is simply becoming focused more on the what than the how. So what I find in my own difficult conversations is that coming back to that vow of I, I care about this person, whether it's a, a you know, parent-child relationship, a spouse relationship, a professional relationship, a, a mentor-teacher relationship, or an employee <coughs> relationship, any, any kind of relationship I might find myself in, a police officer on the street, an administrator in an office, any kind of relationship I might find myself in. If I can come back to, I care about this person and I want to work together. That's, that's my vow. You know, I invite you to find your vow. That's my vow that I come back to is caring what's going on for them and wanting, actually wanting um, to work together. And, and before the talk, Lou and I were talking a little bit about the effort it takes to have difficult conversations to really kind of bring yourself forward out of your shell, out of your self-protectiveness. Remember I was talking about the arms on the flanks? So if in a dangerous situation, of course, you want, you, know, you want to protect yourself. But if you can imagine that you're not in a dangerous situation and open up, you suddenly opened up a, a myriad of possibilities. And it takes some effort. It takes some, some rise, some effort. And um, so for me, those two things, remembering that I care about the person and remembering that I want them to know that I care about them. Sometimes I have to just completely stop everything that, that I um, think is right or think that is important or think that is useful or think that is relevant or just. You know, I have plenty of thoughts. It's said that human beings are all philosophers. You know, we all have our whole mind trip. But it's actually very difficult to connect with another human being when we're just, like I said, being cerebral. So that's what I find I have to do is, is really stop and make some effort towards letting this person know that I'm willing to get out of the way, give them the forefront, the focus, for just long enough so that we can connect so that we can build some trust again. Um, <clears throat> for maybe 15 years, I ran men's groups. And um, that was the fundamental thing that we did, was build trust. And, and amongst men in particular, well, I don't know what it's like to be a woman, so I can't speak to that. Forgive me. But um, for men, I will say that it's very hard to trust other men. We're kind of programmed from birth uh, to, to not trust men, that men will hurt us, that men will betray us, that um, men will compete against us and do whatever it takes to get ahead of us and put us down. And then when we come into reproduction, uh, we have biological functions that come up in us that uh, tell us that we sh shouldn't trust any other men. Uh, you know, it's me or nothing. This is what it's like to be male. So, um, so it's a really difficult task to actually get men to trust each other. And I've often suspected that it's actually not too different for women. So the biggest task that was put before me in running these men's group was to build an environment of trust and... Um, what I found is no matter what political backgrounds, religious backgrounds, uh, economic backgrounds that the men came from, if we stop long enough to listen to each other and reach out with um, an, a hug, a laugh, a shout, you know, some energy, some energy of connection, of like, 
I hear you, I see you, I'm here together, then, then there's like a shift that happens in it. And it's like the subtlest thing, but it makes all the difference. And if you don't take that time to do that, you haven't built that trust. And actually, all you're doing is creating more irritation and, and, and actually destroying the potential for trust. So it's, trust is such a fragile thing. It's like either it's there or you're actually wearing it away. It's one or the other. I find that in my marriage a lot. Um, you know, if there's a moment of like connection, then, then it's... It's lifting. If, if there's not that moment of connection, then it's just, it's like as if the brakes are, are on, you know, and, and just wearing down the brake pads constantly because it's like, are we actually a team here or not, you know? So that's that bit in the somatic centering about left and right and about uh, remembering that we're social animals and remembering to let others get close to us. Um, <coughs> yeah. I said while we were doing that, what do you see? Or another way to say that is, see what you see. Like actually notice. If you're talking to someone, do you see their eyes? Do you see their facial expression? Do you see the rise and fall of their breath? Do you see uh, in the chest, you can see their movement? In their feet, you can see where their intention is? You know, if somebody is talking to you with their feet like this, they have one foot out the door. <laughs> so, you know, see what you see. Hear what you hear. Notice what you hear. If you're talking to someone and they just said, I don't feel safe. Did you hear that or did you blow right by it? You know? Because that's a really good thing to acknowledge. I hear that you don't feel safe. I acknowledge there might be a power imbalance here. How can we address that? Sometimes just acknowledging it addresses it enough. We can move on, we can work together, you know? If you're talking with a police member that's pulled you over, there's a power imbalance there. And you're not going to change it. There is a power imbalance there. But just to acknowledge it, you know, like when I sit in a car and I'm waiting for the tap on the window, if I just remember, okay, they're the police officer. I messed up. Okay, I can do this. You know, just acknowledging the power imbalance. Whereas I think when I was young, I didn't want to acknowledge the power imbalance. It was like, they're not going to slow me down. And they'd come up to the window and they'd find everything they could harass me about because I didn't want to acknowledge the power imbalance. So that's a big deal, um, acknowledging the power structures. Just to talk about what is a difficult conversation. You guys want to throw out some, some words? What is a difficult conversation? Telephone. What's, What's difficult about that? that? You can't see each other. So you, it's, I don't think we're genetically programmed for it yet. We have okay. Technology out okay. There. So, yeah, yeah loss, loss of uh, visual cues, loss of body language. Yeah. yeah. What, what is, is a difficult conversation? Talking about money. Money. <laughs> finances. <laughs> what makes that difficult? Because if somebody owes you money or you owe somebody money, I mean, if there's a non balance or um, reciprocity, <laughs> you know, it's, it makes things awkward. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very awkward for me to talk about money. Yeah. Yeah. I would not talk about it. And then resentment will build if I don't express myself about it, but, you know, I, I, yeah. I don't like to talk about it. Yeah. What are the three most difficult things? Money, sex, and... Or the most difficult things to talk about in a marriage or something. Money, sex, and... Toilet seat. Priorities. Anyways, yes. It's a very difficult conversation, right? So um, let me just... You know, here's a thought about money. 
Money is a, um, a fabrication that, as a society, we've come up with to represent energy. Energy is spirit. Energy is our life. So when we're talking about money, we're really talking about our life. It matters, right? It matters. Especially to anybody that's bent their knees and elbows to earn a living. You know? Especially to anybody who has worn blisters in their hands and feet and given their life energy, their sweat, blood, and tears towards um, making a living. Um, I don't know anything different than that, so I can't speak to that, but I can say that we're given a certain amount of time on this earth, and with that time, we have some energy. And so, even talking about whether or not somebody owes you $52 for the other half of the dinner that you thought you were splitting, um, that matters, yeah? Yeah. So maybe I might expand that a little bit to say a difficult conversation is when the stakes are high, when it matters. You know, and so with that little bit broader perspective, that could include a lot of different conversations besides just money. Um, yeah. Bringing up to somebody else something that they said or didn't say that offended me and I need to let them know that that happened instead of just letting it go and saying, no, it really didn't hurt me or really didn't bother me. So bringing up something that somebody else said or did that left me feeling angry, hurt, scared, whatever. Yeah, yeah. so bringing up something that you have some uh, feelings about, hurt feelings in particular. Yeah. That's pretty much the heart of it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, hang on a second. Um, so, so I might expand that a little bit again with the phrase emotional charge. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly bringing up anything that feels like it was an insult is really difficult to bring up because, of course, um, what insults me is, is not knowable to anybody else. And it's only knowable to me based on the level of self-awareness that I have. I mean, how often have you had your feelings hurt and you didn't even know that you cared that much about that? Or you don't even understand why your feelings are hurt about it? I mean... That's, That's kind of the point of the conversation, conversation right? right? Is to figure out, why, do this, why does this matter so much to me? Why am I so upset about this? Do you see what I just did? I turned it into a question. I think sometimes we, when we come to a conversation like that, where it's like, you hurt me. So first of all, there's an accusation right there. And second of all... That's a word I won't use. I won't say you hurt me. I use I language. I felt when you said blah, 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 blah. When I point you, then that's defensive. If I say I felt, that's a different way to confront somebody on what they did or said. Yeah, yeah, very good. I love I statements, and they can also be flipped around and used as a tool just as um, just as much of a weapon as without them. So it's a tricky it's a tricky slope. Um, that's why I don't like to give give out any tools because tools can be used as weapons. Um, but what I will say to continue on that, just sorry for a second, um, is the part about making it into a curiosity for yourself about what about this hurt me. Um, you know, why does that hurt? You know, and you might, you might even start on a somatic level of where does it hurt? Is it in the back of the neck? I don't know. 
might be. It might be in the shoulder. Might be in the small of the back. Like where in the body does it hurt? Is it just like center of the heart? Maybe. You know. In other words, just investigate it a little bit. Because I think if you bring that kind of curiosity to somebody else, it sets them up um, with, a, with an avenue to be your ally, to be your partner in discovering that together. A good word to use in that respect is help me to understand why you said dot, 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 dot. Yeah. Help me to understand that's a way to draw somebody in and help them explain, well, why did you do what you did or say what you said? Yeah, why questions are, are, are confrontational inherently. Um, yeah, I, w I would personally for myself just want to understand, you know, why, did, why do I feel? Like if I can ask that to myself, why do I feel this way? What about this matters to me so much that it hurts, you know? Can, can you give us an example of using I statements where it is not constructive, where it can be used in a, in a problematic way? Yeah, my kids are great at it. I should have had them come over here. Um, you know, um, I hate it when you do that. Uh, yeah, 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 it's a legitimate I statement, but it's really not helpful. Anyways, it's a tool. Just be careful how you hold it. That's all I'm saying. So other, other ideas of, of what makes, what, what is a difficult conversation or what makes a conversation difficult? I, I forget which Milos Kundera book it is. It's not the unbearable lightness of being, but it's one of his books where at the end of every chapter he says, um, when he said love, he meant da 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 da. When she said love, she meant da 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 da. So that's, a, I, and how you can begin to, you almost have to like dissect language or dissect, uh, it's it, to get, you know, to the kernel of what, what's going on. And it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and sometimes, you know, you, there is so much fear, or there is so much other stuff going on that, like you said, you don't even know what it is. But to, if you can get there gently together, it's a lot better than trying to. Which we get like that too. Right? Yeah, so you're pointing to just like people having totally different, um, like a not a common understanding of the language that they're using or what they're talking about. Yeah. Conversations that sh should have happened 20 years ago but have been sidestepped. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> and, and it's time. Uh huh. It's past time. Yeah. And, and you know, and to find, to find common ground is like, it's a wasteland. Yeah. Yeah, so there's this weight of, uh, of time that's stacked up. So you've spent 20 years thinking about it, in other words. It's not fresh anymore. It's like fermented. It's stinky, yeah. Yeah, stinky cheese. Stinky cheese. Uh, yeah. So that's a good one. That kind of. When they won't engage. Yeah. So bringing that back to our somatic practice of, um, of the element of time is, is, is our depth forward and back. So if we spend a lot of time reminiscing or thinking about something 20 years ago, it becomes stinky. Um, and we develop back pain, quite literally. I used to be a massage therapist and a lot of back pain, people are dwelling in their past. So what I would say to that is bring some awareness to um, some, whatever it was that needed to happen 20 years ago, but also what's, what's so about that now, you know? Um, otherwise you kind of get into a beating a dead horse thing. It's like, 
what's so about this now? You know, is it, is it that I felt sad all these years, like I didn't have the connection I wanted to with you? And that sadness is still right here alive in my heart 20 years later, almost undiminished, maybe even grown. You know, and in other words, just what's present? What's present? And then what, if it's not present, do we still need to carry it? You know, there's an attachment there. And if it's no longer present, if it's no longer alive, how much can you let go of, you know? How much can you let go of? Because I really think that only authentic communication is present. And certainly, um, I don't think the past goes away. I think I said that when we were centering. I think it's all real close. You know, we say in, in, in uh, my elders taught, when somebody dies, they don't go very far away. You know, the earth that we stand on is made of the dust of their bones. And it takes uh, millennials for, for that to even be inches away in literal reality terms. Debris falls, decomposes on the earth, and it's, it's right here. You know? So even if something happened 20 years ago, to us it's like it hasn't gone away. It's right there. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying forget about it or ignore it. I'm just saying what from that is alive. Because it doesn't go away. You know, if it was 40 years ago. Um, well, what's alive, you know? And how can we be authentic about how that's affecting us right now? And connecting that forward also with like, here's how I want it to be. So that's the last part of this. Imagining a future possible. Navigating difficult conversations is crucial to moving towards the future we imagine possible. So I think that's what I would say about, about old things is like, yeah, what's present and how do, we, how do we want to hold that in the future? Yeah, so other things, other difficult conversations. Were you going to say something before? I was just wondering, um, like, for my memory, it really connects with stories. Mm. And I was wondering if you have any stories of like, what this would look like. So you find yourself in this difficult conversation. For you, how do you apply these things you're talking about in that moment? Because like, for me, it's a lot easier to talk about it when mm -hmm. I'm not in the moment mm -hmm. than it is to mm -hmm. really live it out in that moment. So I'm just wondering how, how you've grown that. Yeah. yeah. So, so I would jump, jump back, back to the idea of practice. practice. The more, if you want to become an athlete, we have these super athletes now. Have you heard about these super marathon runners that not only run 26.3 miles, but they actually run 100 miles? And they don't actually just run 100 miles, they run 100 miles a day for six days straight. So, you know, the human being is capable of amazing things, right? But they don't get that way by just saying, thinking, I'll do that. It takes a tremendous amount of training, practice and will. And so I think that the, um, the actual physical act of spending time practicing finding your center, whether it's one minute a day, five minutes a day, 45 minutes a day, whatever. That's the story that I can tell you about, is spending time actually finding your center finding your center, finding your own dignity. So often we feel we've been put down, crushed by life and the demands and the pressures. So how do we find our own dignity? How do we feel the space that we occupy between earth and the cosmos that nobody else 
occupies. This is your time and space, just being who you are. When, when we have that kind of dignity, then we can be more open. Posture really matters. Um, connection and safety, again, spending time feeling in your own body. I can be open. I don't have to squeeze down. I can be open. I can breathe fully. When we get anxious and fearful, our breath immediately becomes smaller. The mind and the breath are absolutely connected. There's no separation. When our breath becomes small, our mind becomes small. When our breath becomes larger, our mind becomes larger. The easiest way when you're anxious to calm yourself is to breathe deeply. When you need to take in more information, breathe a bigger breath. So the practice of breathing with the chest open, with the arms open, with the eyes open, with the ears open, listening, seeing, touching, you know. So developing this physical muscle memory of knowing what brought you here and knowing what future you imagine going forward. Um, so then, to bring it into the heat of the moment, you have that to rely on. You notice when your own body language is cutting off, squeezing in, hunching over, trying to dominate, whatever different posture you might take. Notice it. Come back to a relaxed, dignified, open, being. And from there, it's like, oh, I see that you're here too. It's not just me, you know? So I think that that's really the only, like I said at the very beginning, that's really the only tool, the only thing I have to offer is the practice of noticing where you're at and returning to that, returning to that, coming back again and again. When other energy comes, try to maintain a good posture. Try to maintain um, a will to care for the other person's well-being. It's really easy to uh, imagine that we're threatened and we want to hurt this other person based on our threat. That sort of um, reptilian brain, you know, I'm threatened, let me get on top of the situation. You know. Um, but if we can come back from, to our dignity, our connection and our purpose, then it's like, I don't need to, I don't need to control you, I don't need to suppress you, I don't need you to be what I think I need you to be. I don't need you to be what I think you are or aren't. Um, what are you anyways? You know? If anything, if anything, there's a little bit of a, of a, a curiosity there then. You know? Mm -hmm. So, it seems to me what you're saying um, that when you're having a difficult conversation where you're in that, that situation, what happens to many of us, most of us, is because you're not practicing this balance, it's, it's, it becomes more of almost a fear-based sort of Lack, uh, lack of dignity, lack of esteem, and that's why the conversation's difficult, because you're not here now and balanced. Is, is that kind of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very well put. I, I hope everyone heard what she just said. Basically, when we're not in our own center, we become fear-based. And that's, that's what makes the conversation difficult. 
It's not so much that it happened 20 years ago. It's not so much that somebody insulted you. It's not so much that they're talking about something that really matters to you, has an emotional charge, has a high stake value. It's simply that we've lost our own center. Right, and you're thinking of yourself as being not enough, enough or worthy yeah. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, we've lost our own sense of dignity. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can come back to finding the length, like whatever language makes sense to you, that you alone have been given this place. You alone have been given this energy to be, and you have, um, you are enough and you have something to give, you know. So from that place, then can we come forward and, and connect? Yeah. I'm going to wrap it up, but maybe we'll take our last comment. I was just thinking, based on what you said, you know, when you're talking about dignity is safety. I think that fear, yeah. when you're fearful, you don't feel safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To counteract that or work with that, is the thing about seeing what I see. You know, I see the wetness of your eyes. I hear tenderness, fluctuation of your voice, you know. So immediately I don't feel threatened. How could I be threatened? You know? This is where uh, someone said, um, phone conversations are hard because we don't have that information, you know. On the other hand, I have a lot of great phone conversations because I can hear a lot. Uh, we have, as human beings have, have developed to be really, really reliant on sight, our sense of sight. But actually, talk, if you spend time with someone who's blind, there is a lot of information available that doesn't have anything to do with sight. I think something like 80 or 90% of our energy goes into visual. And um, so in other words, if you can tone that down a little bit, that makes a lot of energy available for, for a lot of other connection. Um, What's worse almost is writing, like all the texting and emails. Yeah. Then you're really blind. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's take one last one. As a practitioner of Aikido, can you comment on the founder of Aikido's statement that there's, there is no growth without confidence? Yeah, I was picking mulberries uh, yesterday in my garden and um, I was noticing that I was stressed because if I didn't get them all, they were going to rot and they weren't going to be made useful. And I, so I was commenting to my neighbor about how this is, this is like a good kind of stress, you know. And... Uh, and then I remembered the old saying of how um, the lion makes the deer run fast. So there's a certain kind of stress that is actually quite useful. Uh, we were talking about what it's like to bend your knees and elbows and earn a living a few minutes ago. Um, there's a certain kind of stress that when we become parents and we have children to feed, it calls forth a certain energy, a certain commitment and passion that makes us bigger than we were without it. Um, <clears throat> so maybe this is something to the effect of this conflict, this idea of conflict, that, um, that time is limited, that energy is limited, and that without that tension, there's really nothing happening. But, but with, with that, that tension, when we actually meet, that's where uh, life happens. That's where learning and growth happens, is on the edge when two things meet. Uh, the old farmers used to always say that all of, all of the life happens at the, ed, at the well, at the edge of the fields where two things come together. You know, if you, we have a, a master seamstress here, uh, textile artist, and uh, it's all about how things go together. I myself am a carpenter, so it's all about the joints and how things go together. And conversations, of course, are just that. They're about how we come together. So, so there's that, that tension that's necessary, I think, for growth. And so again, you know, to not, not fear, 
these conflicts, but to have some sense of a centered presence and find uh, what we can meet each other, you know, how we meet each other in that way. Yeah. So that's my wish and my intention for all of you, for our community, for our uh, nation and the world that we live in today. May life continue. And may we meet each other and grow in this conflict. I think there's never been a time in history when there was not conflict. Uh, sometimes there's conflict between people of opposite sexes. Sometimes there's conflict between people of different economic statuses or races or whatever there might be. But those are simply the most fertile grounds, you know. Those are simply the most fertile grounds. So that we might reach out to those that seem different and uh, see what we have to learn. Yeah.